Good morning, YouTubers. You have reached the Brian Sledge channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. Uh, thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye. Isolation and the outdoors seems to be a breeding ground for all things creepy. I hope you brought your flashlight as it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I were camping in the Pacific Northwest between San Francisco and Portland. We had rented a car and were stopping at different campsites every night on our way from the former to the latter. The first night we arrive at a campsite, we find that it had been closed for the season, despite the fact that we looked on their website and they say that they were open. So we ended up driving around, looking for another campsite on Google Maps. But at this point, it's getting dark. We see a forest firefighter outpost and pull in to ask them if they know of any nearby. They tell us that most of them are closed for the season, but there are a couple on their old map that we haven't checked. We get back on the road and find our way to one of these campsites. The sign for this place is literally resting on the ground and is a little overgrown. But at this point it's dark as hell, and we really don't have many other options. As we pull our car in to what we think is a spot, we see a few other tents nearby, so we take it as a good sign. We get out and start to set up our things, when immediately, things begin to get strange. Two guys walk directly through our spot, and strike up a conversation with us. Both are looking a little rough. One of them has a zip up hoodie without a shirt underneath. And I notice that he is extremely skinny. They're also both really dirty and have messed up hair. But hey, we're camping. They're both speaking very fast and seem kind of nervous. They tell us that they're actually seasonal workers nearby and are staying at this campsite to save money whilst they're there. Whilst we're talking to these two guys, a decade old white Mercedes pulls into the campsite with all four windows blasting rap music. The driver and passenger look like some real ICP enthusiasts. They look around quickly and leave immediately. At the time, I thought they were probably looking for a campsite too. The two rough dudes also leave, and we continue setting up camp. Not too long after we get another visitor. This time it's an older woman, with a three pack a day voice. She's nice enough, but also asking us some pretty weird questions. You guys here for the horror show, she asks? I'm thinking, what's a horror show? Do you mean the haunted house, lady? She tells us that lots of people come out for the horror show and starts warning us about all the ghouls and zombies. She eventually leaves and my girlfriend and I agree they must be talking about some kind of haunted house nearby as it was early October. And you know, maybe that's where the seasonal worker dudes who looked kind of scary happened to be working at. It all checked out in my mind. We start our fire and I begin breaking out the wood, when my girlfriend admits that she's freaked out. She's worried about the people that we've encountered and how strange this campsite is. She points out that there aren't really any sounds coming from anyone else's tents, with the exception of the one woman, who wouldn't stop coughing. No music, no children, laughter, nothing. I'm starting to believe her. But at this point it's pretty late and we don't really have any other options. I'm also thinking that if the campsite is weird, it's just some harmless weirdos. She seems pacified by my confidence, and we continue making dinner. 
It's at this point a bunch of really weird shit starts happening. The two dudes we met right when we got there emerge from the woods without any source of light and without saying a word, walking straight into their tent. They have a very short and heated discussion which I can't make out. One of them storms out of the tent and walks straight towards the older woman's campsite, making eye contact with me for an uncomfortably long amount of time. He then climbs into the cab of her pickup truck and I realise there's already someone in there, and likely has been for some time. Probably the woman. You can tell that they start smoking something from when the lighter flickers. This strikes me as especially odd. You smoke cigarettes in the car? Probably not. Pot? We're at a campsite in Northern California, and I'm pretty sure there aren't any kids around. Why go into the car to do that? Then it hits me like a sack of bricks. It's meth. They were all smoking meth. And the woman was probably dealing. The level of comfort she had established in her campsite indicated that she'd been there for a while. Meth explained why everyone was looking like emancipated zombies. It explained the juggalos driving through getting spooked and leaving. It explained the strange erratic behaviour and constant coughing from everyone. This was clearly some sort of live-in meth village at a closed down campsite in the backwoods of Northern California. It's at this moment that I realise the second guy is skulking around the edge of our campsite, clearly trying not to be seen. I conceded to my girlfriend that I also wanted to leave. We packed up everything very slowly and normally, trying to make it look like we were just putting away food and putting our fire out for the night. With only the tent left, I tell my girlfriend to get into the car and get ready to back out of the spot. The second I pick up the tent, the woman's truck starts up and her lights turn on. They were blindingly bright circular lights on a rack. I throw the tent into the trunk as fast as I can and I tell my girlfriend to back up. I'm standing behind the car to guide her but also making it very clear to whoever's watching us that I have a hatchet. I was so on edge that if Mr. Rogers caught me off guard, I would have buried that thing into his skull. She throws the car into reverse, hits the pedal and the car doesn't move. I can hear the engine revving, and I see the car lurching, but it's not going anywhere. For a split second I think they've slashed our tyre somehow. This is how horror movies start. Suddenly it hits me. The parking brake is likely on. It was. She backs up, gets on the main path, and I jump in the passenger seat. As we drive out there, we can hear them start screaming about something. Once we get onto the main road, we do a Chinese fire drill. And I drive down the road at warp speed to the first bed and breakfast that we see. It was lovely. I'm a pretty avid backpacker in the Pacific Northwest. Sometimes I'll hike for days on end without seeing another person. I think it's exhilarating being completely alone. There's really no feeling like it. But personally, I can never help but be on edge. The environment is completely serene and friendly, but there's a constant feeling in the back of your mind. It's hard to put your finger on. Most of the time, you'll be chugging along, comfortable in your mind. But when you stop for rest, or to fill up your water, you can't help but to look over your shoulder. Nothing bothers me much out in the woods. I've run into brown bears, and elk trample through campsites late at night, and much more. But one night was different. I was on a deep backwoods hike in the late fall, off season. It was pretty cold, but the snow hadn't quite started falling yet. I like that, in fact. I usually plan my trips this way. The forest ranger that I talked to when I was organising the trip 
said I was the only hiker she knew of who'd be up there at that time. I was using dispersed camping sites so far off the beaten path, they don't have fire pits. That night was five or six miles from the trail into the area. I set up camp at a site about a hundred yards from a stream, close enough that a faint babbling was audible. I'd lit a fire, cooked dinner, read for a while, and was settling down to sleep. I lay, listening for a while to the sounds of the woods and the creek. Just as I was nodding off, I think I hear voices. Nothing distinct, no clear words, but clearly a group of people was having a good time, laughing, maybe telling stories around a campfire. A feeling of dread came over me. I thought I shouldn't leave the tent. Fear like I've never felt engulfed me. All the hairs on my arms, legs, and on the back of my neck stood on end. I lay there for a while in panic, and the voices carry on laughing indistinctly. After a while, they receded into the background noise. I still didn't leave the tent. I was too afraid. The next morning, after a very short night's sleep, I searched the surrounding area and the path to the site. The few shoe prints I found were faded and worn around the edges. Too old and too few to be from the size of the group I'd heard. I tried to shug it off as nerves. Maybe nervousness got the best of me. But I couldn't shake a certain tension. I made good time to my next site, the last of the trip, looking around a little more than usual. Still, nobody to be seen. That site had no stream. Dry camping isn't a blast, but it's doable if you pack enough water for cooking and drinking for the night. It was a lot quieter, just the chirps of bugs and the wind rustling the trees. I cooked my dinner and stayed up a good while after dark, sitting on a log, looking at the stars and listening to the sounds of the forest, trying to hear the voices from the night before. But there was nothing. I turned in for the night, stretching every act out. I lay there, restless for what felt like hours. Finally, calm comes over me. And then, it's back. Nothing threatening or particularly scary. Just the sounds of a group of about 15 to 20 having a good time, barely audible above the background noise. This time, I'm calm and there's what seems like an internal dialogue in the back of my mind. Why not join them? Sounds like they're having fun. I'd really rather stay here. This is entirely unconscious, and goes on for a while. I'd never experienced anything like this. I was worried that I'd lost it. After a time, the noises faded away into the white noise, and I felt that I was alone. The next day, I packed up as quickly as I could and got out of Dodge. During the day, I was more at ease, like I'd always been in the past. I was relieved when I got to the car and started back home. I told the story a few times, and every time I felt a little bit of that dread from the first night. I really had no reason to feel strongly about what had happened. I just heard strange noises in the forest. Nothing extraordinary, but I felt it. On one occasion, I told the story to my teacher, who was a native. He got quiet for a minute, then said I had run into stick Indians. He said that it was good that I didn't leave the tent. Stick Indians are evil and dangerous beings that prey on women and children. The look on his face was sober. He told me not to go back to that place again. These spirits are extremely aggressive and attack and kill at the slightest provocation, including even saying their Salish name, which he refused to do. Whenever the subject comes up, I get that same fear in me. As I write this, I'm thousands of miles from those sites and my arms are still quaking. 
This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of South Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman, in other words, a military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go exploring some back roads and get out of the heat in town. South Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days searching on roads that we knew, finding roads that we did not, and driving for hours into the mountains. Eventually, navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road that we'd never been on before and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for about an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of any other people in the woods. We rounded a bend into the thick fir woods and emerged into a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noises, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, Right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5 foot 5, but regardless the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed that he was looking back into the Aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of colour that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet away from this strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread hit me, and felt certain that there was someone in that tent, and if we could see the tent, they could undoubtedly see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely, someone camping so remote would be, well, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement, nor hear any strange sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? There was no reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in that tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it just the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the campsite, should there be any need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting at the wheel, my heart pounding. 
I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up, with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, and no wood collected. The tent, oh the tent, it was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave to tell Nick what I had seen. As soon as I left, I heard Nick begin to yell, Let's go, let's get out of here! Not knowing what he was yelling about, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Tauros on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men, and the third person was laying against the window of the back seat. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way that we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. I received a call the next day from the trooper, stating that the campsite and the backpacks and all the women's clothing was gone. Though he could tell that people had been in the area, the strange table was still by the thick aspen grove, and I have not returned to the area, and do not have any intention of doing so again. Last summer, I road tripped across the US solo for two months. I left Crater Lake in Prospect, Oregon, heading to California later than I'd planned. And I was looking to camp anywhere I could find. My gas light had been on for 30 miles, and there hadn't been any gas stations, so I was getting a little nervous. I finally saw a sign for a campground and I figured I could talk to whoever was camping there to find out how far away a gas station was and maybe sleep there for the night. It was an old logging site, so the road there was very rough and very far from the main road. I pulled in and there was a mid to late twenties couple at the very first site. I said hello and asked them if they knew the area. I got a sense of genuine friendliness from them. They said the nearest gas station was only two miles away, but that it was closed for the night. The site next to them was open, and they suggested that I take it. I started setting up my tent, and was using a rock to get my stakes in the ground, when the guy showed up with his hand axe and offered to help. Creepy, but helpful. I asked if he drank, and offered him a beer as a neighborly gesture. His wife slash girlfriend came over and asked if I had any pills. Uh, just some ibuprofen. But why don't you have some weed I picked up in Washington? They reminded me to pay for my sight at the self-serve box. More than once. Red flag. So I said I didn't have any cash. They said I could just write my credit card information down and put it in the box. A thousand red flags. The woman wanted to introduce me to the neighbors. So she took me to an RV that looked like it had been parked there for multiple months. Cardboard over the wheels. Dirty. Inside a very drunk man. Somewhere over 60. A woman who insisted on feeding me the tacos she was cooking, and a dog looking at me like maybe I had food in my pockets. The drunk man started a very long story that wound up being a joke with the punchline being Jeffrey Dahmer cannibalism-based. At the moment, 
the woman handed me a taco. I said I had to check on something, got the fuck out of the trailer, tossed the taco to the dog following me, and proceeded to crack open a beer to put together a plan. These people were messed up, but I didn't feel like I was in any immediate danger. I decided to shoot the breeze with the guy from the first couple, and the way he described it, they'd been camping for two weeks because money ran out. Pretty soon I heard the old woman yelling at the man, That's it. I've had it. I had stated that I was thinking about heading over to the gas station to see if it was actually closed, just so I could get a few more miles in for the day. Old lady comes over to where dude and I are standing and says, He's really done it this time. Next ride into town that comes my way, I'm going to take it. I sip my beer. Younger woman says to me, I can ride with you to the gas station, just so you find it. I take a much larger sip of my beer. I'm starting to get really uncomfortable. I make up some shit excuse to go back to my site, rip up my tarp, tent, and fly all together, shove it in the back of my car, and got the fuck out of there. Made it to the gas station, which was indeed closed, but passed a charming B&B less than a mile before. I explained to the desk clerk that I had a very weird encounter at a campsite, and I would be sleeping in my car in their lot that night. She wanted to sell me a room I couldn't afford, but wound up offering the use of their bathroom and morning coffee. Filled up my tank in the morning, and bid farewell to Prospect, Oregon. This is a story that my uncle told me. A number of years ago, he lived in a very large old house in the middle of nowhere, in central Illinois, about 30 miles from any real town or city. He didn't think much of it when he heard a car turn off and someone knock at the door. He figured that his roommate had locked himself out and thought it would be funny to let him figure it out by himself. Only, his roommate was still inside. The knocking got more desperate until my uncle fell asleep. For those wondering how, he was both a boozer, snored loudly, and was on sleep medication at the time. When drunk, the man could have slept through a nuclear explosion. His buddy found the car outside next morning with the doors open. My uncle came outside as the police were questioning his buddy. They tried to find the owner, and they did. Six months later, decomposed in a field, evidently murdered. The murderer still has not been found. He is still rather bothered by whether he could have saved his life. This happened to myself and a close friend, both 23-year-old males. Just last month, we decided to go on a two-day backpacking camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We are both very comfortable with nature and spend a lot of time camping, hunting, fishing, etc. We hiked about five miles into a small lake and set up camp on a small beach. This was not a heavily trafficked area and we did not expect to run into anyone. Our first night there, as we were sitting around the fire, we saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake around 10.30. This was fairly unusual, however, we did not think too much of it, but as time went on, this flashlight kept moving around the lake, getting closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around in the woods in the middle of the night, and we did not particularly want an unwelcomed guest. Once it was clear that the person or people were heading for our campsite, we moved off into the woods nearby to see who wandered up. I took a small axe with me, and my friend had a .22 rifle. Now, 
We weren't expecting trouble, and we certainly didn't want to make any, but we figured we might as well cover our bases. Now, the moment of truth, the flashlight comes near the light of our fire, and it is one man. He has a beard, and is probably in his mid-forties. The scary part was, he was carrying what turned out to be a pump-action shotgun. He walked around the campsite a few times, and then proceeded to enter our tent. After rummaging around for a minute or so, he came out and started yelling, I know you're out there. Why don't you come and say hello? My friend and I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. That is when the man proceeded to fire his shotgun into the woods, not too far from where we were. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing we had drying off near the fire and threw them in to burn. My friend, who had aimed his rifle at the man, asked me if he should shoot. I told him absolutely not, unless he spots us and starts pointing the gun in our direction. Thankfully, the man moved off from where we were after a little while. We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake, ran out, grabbed everything we could fit in my pack, and took off. It was now around 2 or 3 a.m. We ran out of the trail with flashlights and made it back to my car as the sun was coming up. We immediately went to the police department and reported it, where we also spoke with some forest rangers. And that was it. I haven't heard anything back from the police. It wasn't mysterious. However, it creeps the hell out of both of us. I am a biologist, and one of the perks of the job is being able to see some remote and spectacular places that people don't often see. Part of my work involves collecting insects from remote watering holes out in the middle of Australia, a few hundred kilometres north of Uluru. One of the ladies I work with, Alice, lives out there full time and spends a lot of her time in the bush, as well as with the local Aboriginal people. She has a trove of stories and weird experiences, but I just thought I'd tell you about the one that I had. So, as I said, I visit a lot of waterholes out there. Being a very arid region, these waterholes hold great spiritual and cultural significance to the indigenous people. Most, if not all of them, are scared in some way, and they have all traditional stories attached to them. So one day, four of us are heading out to this particular site. A full day of heavy four-wheel driving through the Finky Gorge. When we get there not long before sundown, as we pull up there is a black dingo, standing in the spot that we are going to camp. He stares at us for a bit, then disappears off into the bush. This is normal, they always do that and isn't weird in itself. There are plenty of dingoes out there and they come in a wide range of colours. It's not that common to see a black one around there, but it's fine. We set up camp and have a nice night looking for pythons and drinking wine. We slept in swags, kind of like tents that just fit in a sleeping bag, and sometimes has a little fold-up netting so that you can sit up in there. It was really windy that night, so no problems with spooky noises, and I went to sleep pretty quickly. That night though, is when I had it. The extremely vivid dream about the black dingo coming into camp. It was sniffing around my swag and scratching at the netting as if it were trying to get in. The dream bothered me, and I woke up and went back to sleep pretty soon after. Still, not so weird. We woke up in the morning, 
did our sampling, packed up camp and started off back on the long drive to town. After we'd been driving for a bit, Alice starts talking about how seeing the black dingo at the campsite yesterday really freaked her out. She didn't say anything earlier because she didn't want to spook us, but it turns out that in the traditional folklore, the waterhole is protected by a black dingo spirit. The last time Alice camped out there with other people, one of them had a dream that a black dingo came up to their swag, managed to get in, and began attacking her. This lady woke up in a panic, with long, deep scratches all over her face, and no reasonable explanation for how they got there. I had no idea about this story before I had my dream, and I didn't even mention it to anyone that morning. There is definitely a special feeling to a lot of these places. It's very hard to describe, but when you're out in the country, these kinds of weird semi-spiritual coincidences are commonplace. I'm just very glad that nothing bad came from mine. Allegheny National Forest The Mrs. and I Two Dogs and a primitive site about a hundred yards away from the road. It was very late in the season, so we were literally the only people for miles. Our campsite was set up with two tents facing each other across the fire pit. We slept in one with the dogs, and the other we used for storage. The second night, like an idiot, I decided to leave the sealed food in the storage tent instead of tying it up or taking it to the car for the night. I awoke at 2 a.m. to the sound of ripping and crunching. Jerked completely awake, mind racing, I knew instantly that something was in the storage tent, nomming on some tasty dog food or potato chips. I fumbled for a flashlight and slowly unzipped my tent's fly shine the light across the campsite to the other tent. That's when I saw a pair of eyes. I was expecting a raccoon. The problem was that the eyes were about two to three feet off of the ground. Black bear. Big one. I know intellectually that you're supposed to make noise. I know intellectually that I'm not in much danger. However, being within a few feet of a bear, at night, in the pitch black, not being able to see a thing, but the sounds, the ripping, the heavy tread, the snuffling, it's truly, primally, terrifying. Higher thought processes went right out the window. I zipped my tent back up, and looked down at my wife. Grabbed my axe and stood over her sleeping body in the tent in a defensive position, in case he tried to get into the sleeping tent. I stood like that for half an hour, in complete darkness, just listening to the breathing, and the hurrying, and the ripping, and the eating a black bear eating potato chips at night is very loud. He wandered around the site, even snuffling at the outside of our tent. I never woke up the wife, because why subject her to this terror, I thought. Eventually, higher thought processes started to leak through. The car was 50 yards away. Maybe I could run to it. Maybe I should make a noise. Maybe it will go away. What was I thinking? The car. My keys were by my sleeping bag, and on those keys, oh, those glorious keys, was the electronic fob. And on that heaven-sent electronic fob was the button we all think is useless and annoying if you accidentally press it. That glorious alarm button. I smashed down that button, and the night lit up with honks and flashing lights. 
sound and light crashed through the campsite, and I heard the bear take off. That's when my wife woke up to see her shaking, pale-faced husband standing over her with an axe. After I calmed her down, we got out and inspected the campsite. The bear had ripped its way into the storage tent and had eaten potato chips, dog food, trail mix. It had wandered around to our side to the dishwashing area, probably attracted to the smell of the dirty dishwater with meat residue in it. Still coming down from my adrenaline rush, the wife and I spent the rest of the night sleeping in the car. The bear never came back, and I learned my lesson regarding food at a campsite. And the whole time, the motherfucking dogs never woke up. It was June 1987, because it was the baseball season after the Bill Buckner disaster. My girlfriend's parents owned the place. It was in southeast Idaho. It was a pretty big place with lots of acreage. The guy, who was the full-time caretaker for the place, had just quit. And my girlfriend's dad went out there to find a new caretaker. But the new caretaker couldn't start for one month. Her dad offered to pay me $1,200 to go out there. Free food, satellite TV, and all I had to do was keep an eye on the place and feed the dogs and the horse. I had never been out west, so I took him up on it, and it sounded better than doing landscaping. I spent the time reading, exploring, playing the dogs and riding the horse. It was completely uneventful. Until that night. After the knocking stopped and dogs stopped barking, I eventually went back to sleep. I didn't freak out that much because there were two German Shepherds inside with me, and I had a gun. I kept it on my nightstand. I had been drinking a little, but was not drunk by any means. There were several neighbours that were a few miles away. I was kind of thinking that someone had just driven down the wrong driveway. Next morning at the crack of dawn, I opened the front door to let the dogs out and see a white Chevy Nova sitting in the driveway. It was near the small cabin for the caretaker. The cabin was around a hundred yards from the main house. I called my girlfriend's dad and asked him if he knew anyone with that make or model of car. He said he didn't, and he called the police directly. Police show up, ask me a few questions and walk around the property for an hour or so. The car was locked, and the police had it towed. I have no idea if it was broken down or not. There was only one set of tyre tracks coming into the house. A few days later, my girlfriend's dad called me up to say the guy who owned the car was missing, and to call the police if anything weird happened again. I have no idea who the guy was at all. Don't know how long he was missing or when he was reported missing. Or who reported him missing. He was just missing. My girlfriend's dad didn't know much about it either. After about a month I go back home. The girlfriend and I break up shortly thereafter. I see her out of town a few months later and ask her if she ever found out what happened to the guy. All she knows is that the guy was found dead apparently killed himself 30 miles away. The suicide happened several months after that incident at the house, and he was found a couple of days after that he'd killed himself. I asked her how he did it, where he was found and who found him, and I got nothing, and I never saw her again. A group of friends of mine were staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned, there were no roads leading to the cabin, and it was a good three quarters of a day hike from where you parked the cars. I couldn't go at the same time as everyone else, due to work obligations, so I decided to head up the same day, but a little later. It would mean I would have to camp for the night by myself though. I didn't care. I was kinda looking forward to it, as I've never camped alone before. So, I was in the middle of these woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in this small clearing, probably 40 feet across. I get my campfire going and pitch my small, one-person tent. 
doing all that camping stuff like cooking hot dogs on a stick over the fire and s'mores as well. I probably stay up for a good two to three hours after dark and the entire time I swear I heard shit moving in the woods on the edge of the clearing. I didn't think anything of it at first because the woods are full of animals but as the night went on I realized that whatever it was was just circling the clearing over and over. Once I started paying attention to it, it made four or five laps around before I decided to get up and investigate. The noise stopped as soon as I stood up, and I thought I heard some sounds going away through the woods. I just shrugged it off, thinking it was some fox that got curious and then got scared when I stood up. I decide it's time to sleep. I douse the fire and climb into my tent. I start to doze off and stay in that half asleep, half awake state for a while. I normally hear weird shit when I'm in this state, so I don't think much of it when I hear a voice. Something wakes me all the way up though, and I've realized the voice is real and right outside my tent. It's just above a whisper, and I'm not sure if it was another language or if they were just speaking English in such a way that I couldn't understand. I lay there for some time, I don't know how long, listening and waiting for something to happen. There is just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent, so I can see when a hand presses into the wall of my tent, down near my foot. This freaks me out, and I sit up quickly. Whoever was outside of the tent, tore us out of there, like running full sprint through the woods. I get out of the tent and shine my flashlight around and see nothing. I was expecting there to be a bloody handprint on the tent, but nope. Didn't sleep that night. Packed up camp at first light that morning and booked it to the cabin. I was out backpacking alone one night in the woods, pretty far from any civilization, and as far as I knew, miles away from any other person. I had picked a nice spot to pitch my tent, and had settled in to sleep for the night. I had just closed my eyes, when out of nowhere, I hear this blood-curdling cry. It was without a doubt, the most terrifying noise I've ever heard. It sounded like that of a woman screaming, but in a twisted inhuman way. I grabbed my flashlight, unzipped my tent slightly, and looked around but I didn't see anything. I crawled back into my sleeping bag, heart pounding, and waited for something to happen. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I heard it a few more times, sometimes louder, sometimes quieter, and then suddenly it stopped. I was so absolutely certain that I had just heard someone being murdered. I ended up staying the night there anyway, because I was too afraid to move or to try and hike back down to the trail in the dark. But I don't think I managed to ever get any sleep. It wasn't until I got back, after booking it out of there after sunrise, and I was telling the story to a friend of mine, that he asked me if it had been an elk. I'd never known what an elk sounded like before, but I looked it up. And sure enough, that's exactly what I heard. So, a happy ending at least. This is what an elk sounds like. Scary shit if you've never heard it before. Last year, a friend and I went on a long road trip to New Mexico. We camped most of the way, and our first night we got to camp, we spent in the Jefferson National Forest at a campsite in West Virginia. We had found some pamphlets for campsites at a gas station, and we drove out to a place called White Rocks Campground, which was like a 25 plus mile up a dirt road into the mountains. We were in the boonies. 
on our way in, we saw no cars, except for one truck that was behind us for maybe 15 minutes, but then turned down another road. We passed a huge coal factory with a sign that had said, 62 days since an on-site incident. The only people we saw on our drive were standing on the side of the dirt road, huddled around a plastic bin that was on fire. It was all so odd, but we were so excited about camping and being on this trip, we were just laughing about how weird it was, instead of not being worried about having no cell phone reception or being so deep into the mountains. We finally get to the campground, and it's completely empty. Not a single car or person to be seen. And the campground had about 30 sites. We drove around all of them trying to spot anyone. But when we realized it was just us, we picked a random site and decided to just stick it out. We got out of the car and stood there and just listened. The silence was startling. I love being in the woods. I've never felt scared or intimidated to be out there. But there was such a different feeling this time. There were no bird sounds. It was just thick, silent woods. It was getting dark quick. And we decided to start a fire and put up the tent, try to get comfortable. My friend was in charge of the tent, and I was putting together the fire. While we were trying to go about our business, we would both just stop and listen. My friend even made the point that if anyone was to approach us, at least there were crunchy leaves everywhere for us to hear it coming. It felt like someone was watching us. It was the first time in my life I've understood what that feeling is. I had goosebumps. I wanted to leave, but I kept my cool for my friend. The fire is started. The tent is up. And the sleeping bags are ready. The sun was set. Sitting around the fire together, the darkness seemed to close in on us now. It felt suffocating. My friend brought out a book to read aloud and made us feel more comfortable. While she was reading, I grabbed my headlamp and would occasionally turn it on and look around me. I had the feeling since we pulled into the campsite that someone was there in the woods. Pitch black, and our fire was a beacon. We decided to go to sleep, but that we would pack up early in the morning and get the fuck out of here. We put out the fire, and I decided to grab the one knife we had on us that was still in the car, and kept it beside me in the tent. After getting into our sleeping bags, my friend pulls out her cell phone to see if she had any reception. Nothing. She tried to dial her boyfriend just in case, and I remember saying out loud, we have no reception out here. It won't work. We laid there in the silence, repeatedly watching her phone trying to dial out and then disconnect. Suddenly, about 20 feet off to the left of our tent, footsteps. These weren't footsteps that quietly built up. These were footsteps like someone had been standing behind the tree near our tent and started walking toward us. The crunchy leaves were doing their job. We froze. We just stared at each other, eyes wide. The footsteps continued to walk toward the tent, then turned to go behind for maybe a couple yards, and then stopped. Silence again. Heavy, booted, footsteps, with the same pattern that would be a person walking, not a bear or a deer. My friend grabbed my knife that was laying by my bag and grabbed her headlamp, unzips the tent and gets out and stands in front of the tent, knife out, looking around the area. 
She's a goddamn warrior. It was maybe 45 seconds of silence as we listened for more footsteps or voices. And I could see the light from my friend's headlamp dashing around the trees, but there was nothing there. At this point, she stuck her head back in the tent and said, We're getting the fuck out of here. We then proceeded to, in record time, pack up everything, and in ten minutes we were out of there. I'm amazed about it thinking back on it, how we didn't lose our heads, keeping our cool while we packed, but internally, screaming in terror. We only had our headlamps on, and the whole time we were packing up, I kept thinking about how the hill people would grab us and pull us into the darkness, and we would be completely helpless if they did. It didn't feel like it was really happening. Maybe that's why we were almost completely calm while packing. There's no way this is actually happening on our first night camping. We must just be freaking ourselves out. But I still felt like we were being watched. We sped out of there once done. Now here is where the hill people hunting us was confirmed. As we pulled out of the campsite, there were two black, dirty trucks pulled off to the side of the road, hidden in the trees, but almost still completely visible. They had definitely not been there when we pulled in earlier, and the closest residential homes were 15 miles away. We didn't see anyone around them, but we didn't stop to look either. We ended up finding a motel and staying the night there. And we proceeded to tell the owner the entire story, who was amazingly sweet and comforting. I will remember every detail of that night for the rest of my life. The feeling like we were being watched, hearing the footsteps so closely, so suddenly, and the black trucks of the people who are hunting us. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. If you never want to step foot into the countryside again after this, I don't blame you. Also, I would like to extend a huge thank you to Dark Winter and Duchess Dark for helping me out in this compilation. Links to both of their amazing channels can be found in the description. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe, as you won't want to miss what I have in store for you next. I'm thinking of doing nightclub horror stories for tomorrow. Is that something you guys think you'd want to listen to? Drop me a comment to let me know what you think. And if you have had a creepy or paranormal experience that you wish to share, feel free to send it to my email or submit it to my new Reddit page, which you can find in the description. Also, be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at The Mortis Media, as I often post updates and behind the scenes. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.